my name is Emily Poole. This is Anti-Social Studies AP European History Edition. Let's get started with Unit 2, also called the Age of Reformation. So I'd love to make a foreshadowing question after Unit 1, and it was how will all of this new learning and how will these new ideas change the balance of power in Europe? Who or what will gain power and who or what will lose it? Now that these Europeans are getting all of this technology from the rest of the world, how is that going to shift this balance of power? Hopefully, you started to think, man, this one thing that controlled most of society in the Middle Ages, the Catholic Church, is now going to be challenged. And that's totally true. And that's exactly what happens in this unit, this age of Reformation. So my guiding questions for this unit are, what are some core Protestant beliefs and how, are they, how do they compare and contrast to Catholic beliefs? And then how did the Protestant Reformation politically and culturally impact Europe? So we're focusing on a couple different themes here, comparing Protestantism with Catholicism, and then we're looking at causation. How did this one event lead to political and cultural changes across Europe? And now I just have to remind you, this is an intro video. I'm not going to tell you everything you need to know about this unit. I love this unit, but I don't have time to talk about all of that. So I'm going to try to keep, give you this broad general over, overview of what to expect in this unit. Now before we even move on, y'all, whoo! We need to understand that under the banner of Christianity, there are many different denominations of Christianity. So maybe you learned about the Great Schism before that's going to split the church into the Roman, or the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, but we're looking at this one right here that says Reformation. So the church that had dominated Western Europe during this time was the Roman Catholic Church. And then when Martin Luther nails his 95 theses on the church door in Wittenberg, in 1517, that leads to an incredible amount of new denominations forming. They're all still Christian. We are still under the branch of Christianity. We have Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox, and now these Protestant denominations. So, all still Christian, just practicing a different maybe um, version of Christianity, kind of depending on how they interpreted the Bible and how they interpreted um, theological concepts from the scriptures. So again, I've kind of talked about this a little bit already, but Europe was culturally unified by Christianity for centuries. After the fall of the Roman Empire, that Catholic Church stepped in to fill the political void, and it united a lot of these Europeans together culturally. Another important thing to note that goes back with contextualization, but really the only literate people, the only people who could read and write, are going to be people who work for the church, like the clergy and monks and nuns. Um, and because they're the only ones who can read and write, they're the ones who are interpreting scripture on behalf of people. So when people come to church on Sundays in Europe, in the Middle Ages, and the bishop stands up and is like, hey, this is what the scripture says, the people are going to be like, oh, yeah, that's totally what the scripture says, because they can't literally fact check it for themselves because they can't read it. So Martin Luther, thanks to the printing press, thanks to Johann Gutenberg in the 1440s, is now able to um, become literate, can read, can write, and so can a lot more people in Europe, because we now have access to the printing press, and um, starts to read the scriptures. And a lot of people start to read the scriptures, and they're like, whoa, 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 I don't understand what's happening here, because what the Catholic Church has been saying, specifically about indulgences, is not what like I'm finding in the scriptures here, so that doesn't make sense. So because of this widespread literacy, thanks to the printing press, um, a lot of people start reading the Bible on their own, and then start to draw their own conclusions on their own. So it's not from what a bishop is telling them or what a priest. So some major Protestant ideas and people that you will encounter in this unit. Martin Luther obviously kind of kick-started the Protestant Reformation. Another one, of course, cares a lot about is this guy named John Calvin, who um, focuses a lot on predestination. And if you have questions about that, I can probably make a video about that as well. Huguenots and Puritans are other two Protestant groups that emerge. I just need you to associate those words with Protestantism. Major Protestant beliefs, sola fide. It's by faith alone that one is saved. It is by faith in Jesus. It's not by good works. It's not by giving money to the church. It is by faith in Christ that saves believers. Um, so that is going against uh, what the Catholic Church at the time was teaching, which is that it's also through indulgences, which is um, paying money for forgiveness of sins. And Martin Luther's like, that's not what the Bible says at all. It's really just through faith alone in Christ. It's not like an extra work that we have to do. So some political effects of the Protestant Reformation, man, it led to a lot of wars in Europe led to a lot of wars in Europe between Catholics and then these new Protestants. And this, of course, is going to be centered in the Holy Roman Empire, aka Central Europe at the time, because Martin Luther was German and was living in Central Europe. So these ideas spread quite rapidly, again, thanks to the printing press. Um, a bunch of German princes are like, hey, wait, this is like a great way to take power away from the Catholic Church and give myself more power. And then everyone follows suit. So we have wars break out across Europe 
between Catholics and Protestants, or another way you can think about it is between Habsburgs, which is a very Catholic family, and non-Habsburgs. As you're learning about these wars in the class, I want you to consider, are these wars more politically motivated or are they more religiously motivated? Some of these wars start out with genuine, genuine religious conviction of, hey, the Catholic Church is doing this wrong, Protestants are doing this right, like we need to convince people that Protestants are doing this right. But then also, a lot of them are just very politically motivated. Hey, the Catholic Church has held power for centuries. How can we weaken it? Oh, we can just convert to this other version of Christianity, and then we can get more power and take away power from the Catholic Church? Let's do that. So keep that in the back of your mind as you're learning about all these wars that break out. Some other social and cultural effects of the Protestant Reformation, literacy and social structure changes. So obviously, Martin Luther is going to say, hey, we should read the Bible on our own because the church has been misinterpreting it. So like, it's up to us to interpret the Bible and we should be like literate in the scriptures. And that itself is actually going to lead to so many new Protestant denominations forming because people are reading it for the first time and they're like, wait, I believe in this type of theology, not this type of theology. So that's gonna lead to more conflict too. But literacy does increase because Martin Luther said we should read the Bible on our own. It also leads to some social structure changes and this goes back to humanism and the Renaissance, right? With this focus on the here and now, not necessarily just the afterlife. Um, there's more of a question about like what women should do. Martin Luther advocates for a priesthood of all believers, which means that in Christ we are all united and we all are on equal footing. But then what does that do with like women? Because women have like historically, right, been kind of below and been underneath. So like now can women be nuns? Can women be pastors? Can women be preachers? So that kind of opens up this whole new debate on like what are women's roles? How should women respond to this new like equality in Christ? This also leads to, Protestant Reformation also leads to the Catholic Reformation. The Catholic Church is like, what is happening? We also should try to reform some of the ways that we've done things wrong in a way to try to fix some of the wrongs that were actually addressed in the Protestant Reformation. And then also without the dominance of the Catholic Church, local governments start to regulate morality and that just leads to a mess of things. I, uh, last thing I wanna talk about is Baroque art because this is an offshoot of the Catholic Reformation. Baroque art is supposed to be like heaven on earth, um, extremely spiritual and emotional and passionate and beautiful. So if we're looking at these examples here, the one on the left, that's uh, the Ecstasy of St. Teresa by Bernini. And then we have the interior of the Hall of Mirrors, which is at Versailles at the top. And I think this one on the bottom is from a church in Spain. So you see, again, these rulers commissioning these monumental pieces of architecture, these Catholic rulers commissioning these monumental pieces of architecture to try to encourage and entice people back to the Catholic faith, to keep them as Catholics and to not allow Protestantism to spread in their respective states. And this also is in great comparison. If you look at Protestant churches at the time, um, Protestants are all about, no, 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 it's faith alone. Like, let's not have these kind of like extra things that would distract us from like the beauty of the gospel. So therefore, um, let's just have nothing on the walls. And you can look up these Protestant churches and it's literally just like white walls. So that's another like visual representation to, to remind you of the difference between the Catholic church and the Protestant church, especially at the time. So some foreshadowing. Protestant Reformation changes a lot of things. It's a new version of Christianity. A lot of people start to convert to it out of genuine religious conviction, but then some people, some uh, political leaders say, hey, you know, this is also a great way to like consolidate my power by making a new state religion that is not the Catholic Church so that I can intentionally weaken like the power of the Catholic Church in my country. So our next unit is all about governmental styles. I want you to think, how will these states choose to rule? Are they going to allow religious pluralism, which means are they going to allow people to choose whatever faith they want to practice? Or are these rulers gonna say, nah, in this country we practice this religion and that's all that we have, that is the only option. And how will these ideas socially, politically, and economically impact those countries? We'll learn about that more next time. As always, make sure you subscribe and like this video and you can follow along anti-social studies on Instagram and TikTok or you can follow me along See y'all next time.